Good morning. We're continuing our series this week called The I Kingdom and how we are looking at different things in our lives and wrestling with our own kingdoms and increasing our own kingdoms. And then there's God's kingdom and this message to seek first God's kingdom. And each week we're wrestling with something different. And we talked about the American home a couple weeks ago and our youth did a great job talking about how they saw God's kingdom come into this world. And this week we're talking about uh, the throne room of the kingdom, which would have been the place where kings and queens would entertain themselves. And we all are, so we're going to talk today a little bit about entertainment and how we spend our leisure time and how we entertain ourselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I've been kind of thinking about this because this, I, I guess I'm going to just say it like it is kind of, this isn't a feel good sermon today, if that makes any sense. Does that make sense? It's not But I'm also not trying to make anybody feel guilty at the same time. I'm really, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to share some thoughts and some ideas that challenge us in a way to rethink about how we spend our time and how we spend our money and how we're investing in the the kingdom of entertainment or the entertainment industry sometimes more than we are in in God's kingdom. And so I really want us to wrestle with it. So I'm not saying, the, the other part of that is, this is my disclaimer, I'm not saying this is all bad. Okay, does that make sense? I'm just asking us to think about what we're doing and how we're spending our time. So, with that, let me share some statistics with you this morning. They, uh, the average American, according to the Department of Labor and Statistics, the average American spends 2.7 hours a day watching TV. Now, that adds up to about 19 hours a week if you add up all those days. And it's still the number one leisure activity in America, just TV, flipping on the channels, watching TV. And they're predicting now that the average size of the TV that will be sold is going to be 60 inches in 2015. So you're going to go to, you and I are going to go to Best Buy in 2015, and the average size of TV that we can buy is going to be 60 inches, all right? I've got, I, I will, I've got a 32 inch, I've got half that in my house right now. So, and, and so we're going to double the size of our screens. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of. The other thing is, um, also, something that's really grown over the years are video games. Now, does anybody here remember the Atari system? Am I, you know, I'm dating myself, but we went out, and I remember begging my parents to buy an Atari, you know, and it was like this little joystick, a red button, and missile command, and you just kind of moved it. And, it, and now video games have evolved. You're actually immersed in the video game, the first-person video games, and you're immersed into these worlds and these fantasies, and all this goes on. And so, and they, I would say video games actually are, I mean, I thought I was addicted when I was a kid to missile command. I think they're more highly uh, evoking and, and even more addictive today. They predicted in 2015 sales of video games will be $112 billion industry. The, in 2010, it was a $67 billion industry. So it's almost going to double in the next few years the amount of money that's being spent in the video game industry. What do you think is the average age of the video gamer? You know, we tend to think it's a kid thing. It's not. The average age is 35. The actual, it, the market for video games, the person, the average age of the purchaser, the per- person in our culture who spends the most money on video games is age 40. So think about that. So it's not just, it's, it's because remember, and I'm in the 40s, and I was the first, my, it was my generation that grew up on video games. I grew up with the Atari and the little, pat, remember the Pong, you know, just so simple, you know. Much more complex. Anyway, enough of that. I could talk about that for a while. Also, here's the other interesting thing. The average American youth between the ages of 8 and 18 spend 7 hours and 38 minutes a day interacting with some form of media. So that would include TV, video games, computer, cell phone. Um, What else did I miss there? Did I miss anything? Yeah, well, iPad, yeah, any types of uh, Kindles, iPads, those types of things. And the thing is, is that our youth today are not just, it's not one at a time. It's TV, computer, cell phone, all at the same time. So that seven hours and 38 minutes is, actually includes that. So it's seven and 38 minutes. If you actually broke it all out and, and added it all up, it would be over 10 hours. So think about how that, so because they're multitasking their, their entertainment, their media, and so that's what's happening. So 
our youth of today are, are in a different place in our society in dealing with media and with entertainment. We could all, I mean, I could go on with this. I could bring out statistics about the movie industry, sports, uh, which is another way we use our le- leisure time to entertain ourselves. We could talk about concerts and music and all those things and the ways we entertain ourselves in the entertainment industry and in the music industry. And I just thought I, I'll just stop, with, stop there. So, so I want to share something. I want us also to think a little bit more deeply this morning. I'm going to invite us to think more deeply this morning about media. Um, and so I, you're going to have to forgive me this morning because I dipped back into my dissertation for some of this information. And so, so you know, if, if, if you go to sleep right now, I'm not going to be offended, okay? But, it, you know, just stay with me if you can, right? Just take, go grab some more coffee and come back in. So here's what's going on. In the 1960s, there was a man named Marshall McLuhan. He was an English literature professor. And he started to challenge uh, our society around this idea of TV and media and entertainment. And he's famous for a couple quotes. And this is back from the 60s. He said, one of his famous quotes is, the medium is the message. He was talking about TV and movies. And he's saying that the, the actual ability to edit things down is actually creating and becoming a message in itself. So, so for example, reality TV is a good example of that. You know, they film somebody for a long period, 24 hours, days, or whatever, and then they are able to edit it down so that we'll engage in the, really the parts that really are interesting. But if we were to actually live it with them, it would be pretty dull and boring most of the time, right? So this ability to edit, to evoke emotion, is something that is going on with the media. The other thing, the more important quote, I think, for Marshall McLuhan shared with us, he said this. He said, we are what we behold. We are what we behold. And what are we beholding when we're entertaining ourselves? What are we beholding when we're watching TV? What are we beholding when we're on our computer screens? What are we beholding when we're on our iPhones? What are we beholding on our iPads and our Kindles? I mean, it's all about that screen, isn't it? And so we're beholding something. And what is it that we're beholding? And Marshall McLuhan would argue, we become what we behold. We are what we behold. And to think about that really ought to challenge us to think about that. So we are what we behold. You know, isn't that what the king of Israel was saying when He said in Ecclesiastes, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. And that's really what's happening in us today. And we're doing, we're spending a lot of time beholding and allowing uh, or just going after and and whatever our eyes desire. we, We look at those things, we seek those things, we behold those things. So what's happening to us when we're doing this? Well, NYU also did a study of brain. They do the brain imaging while people are watching movies and TV. And they found that depending on the type of movie, like a documentary versus a thriller, that the documentary really didn't engage that much of the human brain. But when you were immersed in a movie that was like a thriller or emotionally engaging, more of the human brain was consumed in watching of that. And so what they found was that more of your brain is actually working and active as we're drawn into that movie or into that TV show or whatever it is. And so our emotional state is actually going up. Our intellectual state or our rational, critical thought part of our brain is going down. So think about that. So I'm emotionally engaged with this, but my critical thinking processes are starting to diminish at this point. Okay, so not, I'm going to pick on both men and women this morning on this one. So I'll start with the, 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 my fam. My, I live in a household with women, and we can watch a movie like The Notebook. All right? Do you all know about the movie Notebook? It's, it's a romantic movie, and we all watch it together. And at the end of the movie, I'm perfectly fine, and I've got three women in tears, you know? So, so, What's going on there? Is there critical thought going on in this? No, not at all. No critical thought. It's all emotional engagement. You know, tears are coming down and everything. And I'm going, what's the big deal? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just a notebook, right? 
And why, why aren't we going back to the battle? Wasn't he in war or something? Okay, let's go back there, right? So here's what's going on. So the other day, so that's, that's one side of it. I would say that men get emotionally engaged in movies just as much as women get emotionally engaged, just in a different way. So take, for example, same household. I watching cable TV, Rambo's on. Do you all remember Rambo? Remember the movie? They made three movies, right? Rambo's on. So I'm watching, I'm going back and I'm reminiscing, you know, I'm going watching this old Rambo movie, and my daughter, teenage daughter, comes in, sits down on the couch, and finally after about five minutes goes, Dad, what are you watching? What is this? I said, this is Rambo. I said, he's going, he's going after the bad guys, he's rescuing POWs. I mean, what, what more do you want from a movie? I think it was Rambo 2 or 3 or one of the, I don't know, 15, whatever it was. So, you know, and, and like in another five minutes, she gets up out of the room and is like, oh, you know, whatever, you know, and she walks out, you know. If it had been the notebook, she'd have stayed the whole time. But, so what I'm saying is that we're emotional, men, we get emotionally engaged about different things. You know, it's about justice and it's about adventure and it's about seeking, sometimes even seeking revenge or getting justice back. And so we get emotionally engaged as well. So here's what's, but here's the point. The point is we're getting emotionally engaged in these media, forms of media, but our critical thinking skills start to turn off. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't come back on when we stop watching or that we, we lose them altogether, but for those moments when we're immersed in those things where our critical thinking is going, going down. And so we're not really filtering out what we're watching. And so that may have an impact on it, may or may not. Now, one other, one other quote, and then we're going to move on. Neil Postman in the, in the 80s wrote, another, wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And I love the title of that book. But again, he was challenging our culture. And basically, he, he draws this conclusion. He says, when a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when in short a people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. Culture death is a clear possibility. So what he's saying is as we're seeking to be entertained more and more, we are actually killing our culture, killing our society in a way. If you think about that, if you look at the news media today, isn't it more about what can get our attention and little sound bites? You know, what he talks about is baby talk, little pieces, little sound bites that just evoke emotion in us. And so we get emotionally engaged in this discourse rather than really thinking critically about what's going on. And so in some ways, he has some piece of truth there. So what is this message then that the media or the entertainment industry would have us grab hold of? So that's what's happening to us. I also want to share that I think the entertainment industry is not always looking out for our best interests in terms as a whole. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. So, for example, Planned Parenthood did a study, and for whether you like Planned Parenthood or not, doesn't matter. I thought the study was interesting. It said they studied the three TV networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS, and they watched, they covered the TV, and they looked at um, for the prime hours. So in the afternoon and the evening hours, they watched what was on TV on those three networks. And they concluded that uh, over a period of a year, there were 65,000 sexual references or av on average 27 per hour that were coming, some innuendo, some reference over those period of time. And so that's 27 per hour. And now think about this. The year that they did that study was in 1988. So my question is, do you think that's gone down <laughs> or gone up? You know, I, and I actually don't have a statistic on that. I just thought it was interesting that in 1988, that was what they discovered. And uh, so I think about it, and that's just on those three networks. Now, we've got a lot more channels today. We've got a lot more networks. We've got a lot more out there coming into our homes. But to give you another example of this, 
um, take a look at some different TV shows of the past versus TV shows of the day. And I'm being selective here, but just to give us an example, do we have, Mike, can we pull those images up? Do you remember this uh, show, Three's Company? Remember that? And Three's Company was controversial when it came out. Do you remember why? Because this idea that a man would cohabitate with two women was like, whoa, you know, that was a cultural taboo at the time. And, and so this show caused a little bit of controversy, and there was, you know, it was comedy and everything, and it was, you know, it wasn't like they were, it was in a, it, they were friends and they were roommates, it was a cohabitation, but it was a big deal. And it's like back then, in a way, we almost blushed at the idea. Does that make sense? We almost blushed a little bit back then. So now take, for example, this other TV show, Two and a Half Men. Now, I don't watch Two and a Half Men, but I know enough <laughs> from what I've heard and things that I know it's a, it's a show that, not just, that is about just this revolving door of women that come in and out of this male household and uh, relationships with women. And, it, and it's like it's not, it doesn't even matter anymore. It's, just doesn't, it's not even a part of that anymore. And I'm just... And I don't know that, I don't watch it as a TV show, so you can correct me, but that's the sense I get at it. So we've moved from cohabitation even being a potential taboo issue to it's okay to have multiple women coming in and out of, out of the, the bedroom. So, so that's what we're doing. Take, for example, this. Uh, remember the Cosby show? Hey, yeah, the Cosbys. Intact family, uh, professional parents, normal issues that came out of the family that they made fun of and we we you know I enjoyed watching the Cosbys and and so forth and so it was just this kind of wholesome family that had its issues but they wrestled with them and they had the, all the issues they were dealing with and it was kind of fun to watch and, and of course co- comedy as well versus what we see on HBO today which is you remember the Sopranos so not quite the Cosbys right so so what's happened in us in our entertainment, in the entertainment industry, in the media industry, is we've shifted from some sense of value, or what we would say is maybe even a family value or a good value, or some sense of value, or at least discussing a value, to now the entertainment industry is trying to provoke us. Whatever is scintillating, whatever is, uh, is provoking, that's what they're putting on. So it's no longer about at least some value, it's, a, it's now about what can we do to raise the bar or be more scintillating than we were last year. And that's a dangerous place to be. Um, and that's actually what uh, King Sol- the king of Israel was talking about. You know, you can, we can chase after all these things, and we keep chasing, but it's a, it's a chasing after the wind. And we're just going to keep getting further and further. So, and you, we, we, you know, what I hear from the media a lot of times is this, you know, well, well, you'll hear people say in the media, um, you know, we're just reflecting culture. Have you ever heard that? You ever heard that? We're, we're just reporting on what's happening in the culture or in our society. We're not trying to, to change it. Well, that's not always true. Uh, let me read to you the, the, uh, the mission statement for MTV. MTV's original mission statement, according to Answers.com, was this. To own the youth of America... We will tell them, the youth, what to listen to, what to wear, and what to buy. Now, they don't say that on their corporate website anymore. (laughs) But this is what they do say. MTV Networks, a unit of Viacom, doesn't just reflect popular culture. We shape it. So, not everybody in the industry, so the entertainment, some in the entertainment industry, not everyone, but some, are actually on a mission to change the way we think, to change the way we behave, and to have us buy into this kingdom. And we as a people of God are called to seek first God's kingdom. And I think we need to be aware that everything that's coming into our all across our screens is not always innocent innocent. Is not always something that is going to guide us in the right direction. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And we have to put our critical thinking back on to think through that. So that brings us to, I know we've been, this is a long, circuitous route, but that brings us to Ecclesiastes. 
this king of Israel wrote this, this book. And when the king wrote this book, we think it's maybe King Solomon that wrote it. It's, that's the traditional. But we know this person was a king of Israel. And they wrote this book of Ecclesiastes. And this king takes his wealth to seek pleasure. He takes his wealth to entertain himself. And he seeks after laughter and comedy. He seeks after sensual pleasure. He seeks after music and personal projects and hobbies. So he uses his wealth to, to entertain himself, to use up his leisure time. And so he spends his wealth and his time investing in these things that he thinks will bring him pleasure. So he uses this idea, that he, this philosophy or this myth about our world that some would have us believe is that if I have unlimited wealth, I will have unlimited satisfaction. And what this king says is, I have unlimited wealth and I do not have satisfaction. That I, I spent all this money and I spent all this time and I spent all this resources in trying to entertain myself and I was left feeling empty. So that's rep the report from someone who has had it all. You know, we're still sometimes feeling like we don't have it all, so we keep pursuing it all. But if we listen to someone who's been there, who's had unlimited wealth and had it all, and said to us, I've been there, done that, and it's no good. It's not fulfilling. It's not satisfying. It is a chasing after the wind. It's a meaningless effort, and it won't satisfy. So, I did a little experiment this week. I figure you got to practice what you preach sometimes. Sometimes, at least some of the time, right? And um, actually, uh, let, actually, let me back up. I'm sorry, I missed something. Uh, so a friend uh, from our congregation shared, two weeks ago after coming out of church shared with me this quote. Why do we settle for pleasure instead of joy? Why do we settle for pleasure instead of joy? And uh, I, reflecting on that, so I went ahead this week, and so I decided to unplug. I spent the last week unplugged preparing for the sermon, so I said, I just want to unplug, and I want to, so I'm not going to watch TV, I'm not going to engage in any entertainment, um, you know, I, I'm not going to constantly check Facebook and, and do all these things that I do with my leisure time. I'm not going to do those things, I'm going to unplug from those things for a week. And I'm going to just see what happens to myself and what happens and how I engage the world and so forth. And so what did I learn? So I didn't, you know, I stopped listening to music. I didn't watch any movies. And so what I learned was that there were some things I wasn't doing. So when I'm spending my time doing those things, that means I'm not doing something else. And so that means that I'm spending my time in entertaining myself What's, what I'm not doing is sometimes the things that bring me joy. So when I'm not paying attention to the screen, guess who I'm paying more attention to? God. When I'm not paying attention to the screen, I'm paying more attention to my wife. Guys, have you ever been in that position where you're in front of the TV with the remote control and your wife is wanting to have a conversation with you, and you, that your mind's going, put down the remote, put down the remote. This is important, but you keep watching TV. You know what I'm saying? When you turn off the TV, you find yourself paying attention. And so, and it, you know, there are other ways to do it. So what I'm saying is, is that I found myself paying attention more so to the things like, like God, like my wife, like my kids, even like my dog. I think my dog got more attention this week than normal. <laughs> but aren't those the things that bring us joy? Right? And satisfaction. I feel fulfilled when I'm engaged in those relationships. I don't always feel fulfilled when I watch a TV show. And so there's, a, there's something that we need to be aware of. And the other thing that we're not doing when we're entertaining ourselves is we're not building God's kingdom. We're not doing it. We're investing time and resources and money into something, and when we're doing that, we're not investing in God's kingdom. We're not spending time building God's kingdom. And Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. 
And we prayed a prayer this morning. Did you hear that prayer that we prayed this morning? We prayed a prayer and we said, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We pray it just about every week. And sometimes I pray that prayer and I think, all right, God, you go do that. <laughs> God, that's God's job, you know. Like it's God's job to go build the kingdom. And I would say that Jesus is saying, no, it's our job. It's not only our prayer, it's to be our lives. Amen.